Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 192 of At Odds with Wrestling. Joe and Adam here. Adam, hello. Hello, Joe. Just give me a second. Hold on. There we go. Some champion cream ale. Got to drink it before it goes bad. Well, here. I don't know if that's audible. I hear something rustling. So, because you uh, had mentioned uh, that you were going to... Uh, clean out one of those uh championship cream cream ales because the cans apparently were disintegrating <laughs> yeah one of them is leaking the other three are good yeah so we don't typically keep cola in the house right mm-hmm. so i went over to the local convenient mark mart got a giant uh fountain beverage fountain beverage always tastes better for some reason i'm not really sure why <laughs> we can we can get into the soda power rankings but uh there might be a splash or three of uh, some Jim Beam in there as well. So let's uh, see how the night goes. Ooh, nice. This, uh, the All end right. of this show is going to be really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the thing I have to, like, number one, my goal is obviously I have to finish all four of these uh, by the end of the show, which isn't a problem. <laughs> um, but the one of them that sprung a leak, like the can feels like it's maybe 80% full now. Mm. And I'm worried that that one's going to have, like, no carbonation or it's just going to taste weird. So I'm debating whether I should save that one for last when I don't care or put it somewhere in the middle. That way I have a good one as a palate cleanser. I'm unsure of the process, but I'll keep everybody posted as we go along. Right. (laughs) It doesn't matter, Joe. This is the new Adam. I'm in the summer of Adam right now. Oh, that's right. Yes, I've been – you – needed i know that you're threading all of your things together and i think you may have gotten the date wrong on one or two (laughs) the very first one i said it was 2021 other than that i've been good (laughs) right uh you definitely needed some sort of hashtag yeah well the summer of adam i mean i've got months so Uh like i can i can start a hashtag now but uh yeah i'm no longer importing or exporting Uh, i have nothing but i have nothing but free time um, so I literally, I've been telling everybody, like I told Todd, I'm like, I'll go to any Comic-Con. I told <laughs> Brett and DJ, I'll go to any indie show. Uh, I'm available for any podcast other than the A show. If they call them unavailable, but, uh, <laughs> like I have nothing but free time. So, uh, yeah, so I had plenty of time to make a hashtag. And we talked about it last week. You have plenty of time to obsessively stock the stock on the ikea website oh i know uh i was talking to brett on porch talk on weekly purchases this week that's check right. it out um that it's time for both of us to go get some detolfs that's right so. that's a nice that's a nice little trip i don't know where the philly ikea is in relation to um the uh uh, was it the the Mahoning Drive-in? So I don't know if that's like a double trip that you can make. Mm, because I, I you just, keep I in mind, obviously you go to the IKEA that's down in South Philly, right? Uh, there's like three in the Philly area, yeah, all within a half hour. Say, there's each one like right off, like where like there's the big plaza for the Philly, like where you could choose to go to Jersey. Not that you should. <laughs> Nobody um, ever should. And then there's the big plaza. But, like, that first exit right off that big plaza, there's an Ikea. Yeah. Yeah, when I was checking for my original, what do I have now, six, eight? I don't know. Uh, I think I have six. But when I was looking for those, each time I would go to get more, I was going to a different Ikea. Because you were playing whack-a-mole. It was like, okay, this one has eight of them. i got to make a trip down. This And it would change every time, you know? Now, what you should really be doing is... Buy them in bulk. Well, (laughs) yes. You should buy them in bulk, first of all, so that you have the market cornered on them. But what you should also do is you should also start teaching yourself on how to build your own shelving. For what purpose? Like to like to replace the detolfs? Well, again, uh, maybe uh, like the detolfs work, but maybe uh, this is a perfect time to pick up some woodworking skills (laughs) or some some glass skills or something, right? That's how I became old seven finger van. <laughs> yeah. So currently no. they're not in stock at the Conshohocken. Okay. Uh now I will tell you you're looking at the black ones. All of my other ones are white. 
Oh my goodness. They would have to match. Come on, man. But I'm so looking. it lo- it looks like they're not available at any of them currently. If you right, see check, here, Concha Hawken, Paramus, Elizabeth. Yeah. When I originally went looking for Detolfs, I was I was like, okay, I want them in black. And then when I got there, they only had white. But I'm much happier with the white ones. So we're gonna keep them all uniform. Imagine you're one of these cases at a. Uh, ikea that has all these fancy names uh-huh. like detolf or malsaljo <laughs> or Ekit or billy <laughs> billy oh what? billy <laughs> oh billy right who names their kid billy <laughs> but you know what you were you mentioned cornering the market on detolfs i think that's a good opportunity Ooh. if you if i were to find like an ikea that has a bunch of them just yeah. buy like 20 of them because like you said, they're never in stock never. and who, who wants to drive to Philly. So if I told somebody, listen, you can roll the dice and maybe get one and drive all the way to Philly, spend a hundred dollar in gas, or you can just pay me like 120 and I'll give you one, you know, and yes. they're like normally like 70 bucks. So I think this is a good opportunity, you know? If only you had the time to devote to this. (laughs) I have nothing but time, Joe. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) All right. right. I'm glad you're taking it in stride. Absolutely. I'm loving all of it. All right. Well, let's get into this, my favorite segment of the show. And now, At Odds with Wrestling presents This Day in Wrestling History. So this day in wrestling history, we're going to bounce around a bunch. Uh, Obviously, we have our head-to-head in 1997, Raw versus Nitro. Uh, Nitro is weird. Like, they're they're doing this weird angle of, like, who the number one contenders for the tag titles are. Okay. So that's why you have, like, matches where Masahiro Chono and the Great Muda are defeating the Steiner Brothers. And Cyclope and Damien are defeating the Harlem Heat. Huh. I, that, I would not have expected Harlem Heat to do, to lose that match for going. Right. Well, because like the, the book, uh, Harlem Heat come out and distract the Steiners, causing them to lose. So the ah. Steiners come out and yeah, yeah. Um, there's some promos building up a Ric Flair Scott Hall main event that ends in a big schmoz. Uh, there's promos with Macho Man and DDP that's building up their rematch at the next pay per view. Okay. All right. Raw, on the other hand, is a weird mixed bag, right? Uh In that we're on the road to King of the Ring. And in hindsight, knowing what happens like two, three, four weeks down the road. uh, Like this is just a very strange Raw, uh, all things considered. So we have Farouk beating Ahmed Johnson, which is kind of sort of the blow off to their feud. (laughs) Mm-hmm. We okay. have gold. We have gold dust beating Triple H, which is kind of the blow off to their feud. We have Undertaker v- beating Sid for the you know to defend the title in their rematch from WrestleMania, which was two and a half months prior. In a four minute and forty seven second banger. <laughs> right, right. Um, we have uh, Shawn Michaels and Steve Austin losing. By count out to the Road Warriors because it's announced at this show that Brett is too injured to do the match that they set up last week at King of the Ring. Oh, typical Brett just dodging matches, you know, so now, always an excuse. So now the match at King of the Ring is Shawn Michaels versus Steve Austin. Mm-hmm. And again, keep in mind some of the results on some of these matches, like Goldust kind of sort of wins his feud with Hunter Hearst Helmsley. Farouk kind of sort of wins his feud with Ahmed Johnson. There's a lot of changes to all of these people, like coming within the next like three or four weeks, mm-hmm. which makes all of these results in retrospect seem very odd. Okay. We'll Keep that. all that in mind. Yeah. Follow this as it develops. Right. Uh, also on this day, wrestling history in 1989, Adam, why have a Merry Christmas? When you could have a no-holds-bar Christmas. 
because <laughs> No Holds Barred came out in theaters today in 1989. What does that have to do with Christmas? Because, okay, so keep, and again, movie comes out in June of 1989, and it's already on uh, pay-per-view. Because if you remember back in the day, um, before a lot of times before a movie would come to VHS, mm-hmm. and then to HBO, it would come to pay-per-view. And I'm pretty sure that's still the case now, even though like nobody buys pay per view. But like Directv is always trying to sell me movies that aren't you know on DVD yet. You know, well, pay, well, paper, pay, the pay per view today is digital on demand. Yeah, you know, like hey, you can get the Batman like f- if you subscribe to like HBO Max. You know, four weeks after it's in the theaters, and then the DVD comes out like three or four weeks after that. Yeah, but. Uh, movie comes out, movie's a flop because the movie stinks. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. <laughs> um, and they set up to do a pay-per-view special in December of No Holds Barred the Match and No Holds Barred the Movie. Where you rent the movie, No Holds Barred, and as part of that whatever vig that you pay to the pay-per-view people, <laughs> you also get the exclusive steel cage blow-off of Macho King, Randy Savage, and Zeus taking on Brutus the Barber, Beefcake, and Hawk Hogan. <laughs> this is why I'm an unreliable narrator in my own story, because I've said many, many times that my earliest memories of Hogan don't start until 1990, but I could have swore I saw this movie in theaters. Right. There's a chance so, that you probably did see this in theaters. Yeah. But, like, why would I go see it if I didn't know who Hogan was? It's just all very fuzzy to me because maybe you just thought it was like a generic action movie right oh that's possible prowler might have took me <laughs> right um so we're uh but the there was commercials on world wrestling entertainment tv of vince saying why and i'm not gonna do it again because i have to a oh, full podcast to do yeah but why have a merry christmas when you could have a no holds barred christmas no holds barred the match no holds barred the movie ordered on pay-per-view this december seems like a bargain it was like a bargain at thrice the price. <laughs> yes. Now, I, I I also want to mention, uh, this day in wrestling history, nine years ago, was the Chikara event, Anniversario Never Compromise. Okay. Now, if we weren't throwing in AIW shows and stuff, mm-hmm. um, we were, probably would have been watching this for my homework probably like a week or two ago or maybe like right around this time you know yeah um but this event is the chikara shutdown angle oh okay see even i know about this right (laughs) this is where uh there was an inconclusive finish in the main event spoilers for a show that we're we're probably going to be watching here on the paper uh, on the podcast in the next couple weeks uh months whatever um the they they ushered the fans out of the building um and one of the fans was so upset that he threw his body into the windows at the trocadero and broke the glass and i know that chikara's response to that was to find the largest human being possible and make him stand intimidatingly in that in front of that glass door. right <laughs> right Wow. Um, but this was, uh, well, you know, do I talk about it now because it's the anniversary or do we get into it later when we actually watch the show? So when we watch the show, we'll talk about the show, right? Okay, yeah. But this was around the time where a lot of people had to sign an NDA uh, for Chikar, and God only knows if these things would have held up in court. Uh, <laughs> I highly doubt it. Um, to not... St- tell anyone that this was all just a storyline that Chikar really wasn't shutting down Mm -hmm. Um, all the other wrestling is promotions that had come up throughout the course of the previous you know over 2013 and and of 2012 you would see like your Chikara favorites there and it would be one of those things where like teams were broken up but if you wanted to see Dasher Hatfield, you would go see him at Wrestling Is Fun. If you wanted to see Sugar Dunkerton, you would go see him at Wrestling Is Whatever. If you wanted to see Hollow Wicked, you would see him at a different one. If you wanted to see this one at a, the like the 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 core group of people were all split up. They were all scattered across the Indies, right? In that it wanted to make you 
uh, excited so that when Chikara comes back, you get all of these parts of Chikara that were broken up all back together. Sure. Um, so a lot of people, a couple people refused to sign the NDAs, um, citing, quote, I signed up to wrestle, not to play pretend, which, again, I don't know. <laughs> All right. Um, now, I never signed an NDA. I never had one put in front of me. Okay. Um, now, would you have signed? People... Would you have signed one if it was put in front of you, young no. Joe Sposto? No, I would not have. Okay. Because, again, what were they going to do? Like, if I, I wasn't going to say anything. Um, and if it meant me not signing it meant that I was done with Chikara, then, you know, so be it. I would have, I was done with Chikara in like three or four years after this anyway. Gotcha. Well, let me ask you this. And I'm just, again, I'm just playing devil's advocate asking sure. the question. If, if you would not have said anything one way or another, why wouldn't you have signed it just to not rock the boat? Um, so that's the thing. I don't know. I never had it put in front of me. Like I'm saying today, nine years removed, I wouldn't have signed it. Yeah. But I'm sure at the time, if it was given to me, I would have signed it. Yeah, because, I mean, now you're looking back at it with, like, a fuck you, Mike attitude. where like, I'm not signing anything. But, you know, maybe yeah. in 2013, you would have. So this was one of those other things that, like, internet legend is that Mike did this very quickly because he was divorcing his wife or his wife was divorcing him. She was the money behind Chikara. And... She didn't want, or Mike didn't want her to take Chikara in the divorce proceedings. Keep that in mind. Yeah. <laughs> Taking an independent wrestling promotion in divorce proceedings. A very lucrative, you know how lucrative independent wrestling is, you know? A very just... lucrative independent show where Mike would regularly tell us that every show was building to pay for King of Trios. Mm-hmm. And then King of Trios would pay for the back half of the year to get us to next year's King of Trios. <laughs> paycheck so, to paycheck. Ex essentially, yes. Yeah. Um. So Mike's plan, and again, that's his wife's plan. In the divorce proceeding, she's going to take an independent wrestling promotion. Mike's plan was to outsmart her, was to close Chikara as part of a storyline so there was no Chikara for her to take. <laughs> huh? <laughs> Makes perfect sense. Makes and all this is a, this is a story that many people that I can well okay that a few people that I consider smart believe, and a lot of people that are really bad people and assholes continue to spread this lie and rumor to this day. <laughs> Mike told me the entire story at one of the wrestling is fun shows, like. Six months prior to this. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, Mike may have known that his wife was going to divorce him six months ahead of time. So he had time to start laying this out. But the people that live in this fantasy world that this was hastily thrown together to get Chikara off the book so that it couldn't be taken in divorce proceedings um, proves. Uh, and maybe we'll come back to this uh, when we get into talking points, uh, how stupid wrestling fans are. <laughs> I don't know, Joe. I believe everything I see on television or on, like, Smart Mark video. Okay. Yeah. I'm now, very gullible. <laughs> uh, well, join the club, I guess. Uh, so on this day in wrestling history, we had several deaths actually line up on this day in wrestling history. Oh. Um, and again, you know, like I said, usually, but it's characters, it's... Uh, one is not as famous as the other two, but should be, at least in my opinion. And the one was actually someone was I was thinking about quite a bit this week, for whatever reasons. Okay. So, on this day in 1998, the Junkyard Dog passed away. Okay. Uh, due to complications from a car accident. I think he was only like 46 when he passed, right? Yeah. And... The reason I was thinking to myself is, um, you know, I, I listened to another podcast, uh, Our Vantage Point, and they, they're going through, like, week by week of, it started out as the 1982 WF canon, and they're already up to late 84, and Junkyard Dog has just come into WWF, like, within the last, like, two or three weeks, right? Yeah, let me know when they hit 1990, I'll start listening. 
Uh, so th- this is their Monday show. Their Friday show is they just started it maybe about two weeks ago where they're watching every Monday Night Raw from the beginning. So they skipped over 1990 and went right to 1993. So I'm sorry. Oh, all right. Well, that's going to be a hard jumping on point then. <laughs> so I was thinking to myself, so Junkyard, I was kind of reverse engineering this. Like Junkyard Dog comes into WWF in 1984 and he comes in maybe as like the f- third or fourth top baby face because Hogan's number one, Sergeant Slaughter is still technically number two, and when he shows up, Jimmy Snook is number three. Mm -hmm. Tito Santana could arguably number four or Junkyard Dog. So he had previously been in Mid-South Wrestling where he arguably was the number one baby face there. Um... And he came and they buried him real good on Mid-South TV. Boy, howdy, did they ever. <laughs> Whenever, whenever somebody would leave Mid-South to go to WWF, and they would pull out the old archival footage of them losing matches to guys that were still in the promotion. But then, like, the rib is on them. It's like, oh, we're going to dust off this old footage of Butch Reed killing the junkyard dog. And then, like, Butch Reed leaves three months later, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, but so then I start thinking back, like I've seen some of the junkyard dog stuff in mid South and like 82, 83, but junkyard dog started out as a heel in mid South. And I don't think I've ever seen any of his heel stuff. And I was just thinking to myself, I'm like this character that like, whether you've seen him or not, or whether, you know, you, whether you grew up in the eighties or whatever it is, I think pretty much everyone has an idea of who and what the junkyard dog is. Sure, like most of his reign was before 1990, but like I still have familiarization with him, like with the cartoon and like yeah. just all that stuff, you know? So to to take that character of what he is in our memories and think that he was a heel is just so strange. And I'm like, I really want to see some heel junkyard dog stuff. Is that like readily available somewhere or you got to look on I YouTube don't know. or whatever? Hmm. I don't know, but like him, his, the, his, the anniversary of his passing being on today as we record uh, is something that I'm like, oh, I got to dig a little bit deeper to find some of that stuff, maybe. Yeah, when you find it or when somebody sends it to you, tag me in it. I wouldn't mind checking out like a couple minutes of that. Yeah, yeah. I've, uh, like, so, you, like you oh, said, oh, I was just going to say, I have no frame of reference to like JYD being a heel. Right. Uh, now, also on this day, wrestling history in 2003. Classy Freddie Blassie passed away. Okay. Um, obviously, we all know Freddie Blassie. If you're from the 80s, he was like the manager of like the Iron Sheik and Nikolai Volkov. Um, primarily, and then in late 85, early, or actually late 86, early 87, he sells uh, his charges along with the Mighty Hercules to, to Slick. And then for a period of time, Blassie and Slick are like co-managers. Mm-hmm. And then by the time that we hit like WrestleMania three, Blassie's just gone. Yeah, this is a guy that I have no memory of in my early wrestling days. Like I know about him just from like watching video cassettes later on, but like the early days of me watching wrestling, he was nowhere to be found. Was he in Body Slam? Uh yeah, oh, uh, yes, the fantastic film Body <laughs> Slam where they do the crowd shot of all the luminaries that are there to see. Uh, yeah, yeah. Rick McGraw or Quick Rick and Tonga Tom <laughs> wrestled the big match with the uh, the Rock and Rollers playing. I think this is the fir- that was the first time I and probably the only time for many years that I ever saw Freddie Blassie. So Freddie Blassie gets like a re- like he would pop up here and there on WF TV, but like mostly on like primetime wrestling just to like the fuck with Bobby and stuff. Mm-hmm. But then like Attitude Era and right up until his passing, if you remember, like. He was like the wizened vet that would come and rally the troops to take on the w- the Alliance invading, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and that he would do like those voiceovers for like the history pieces for WWF. Yeah. Um, but Freddie Blassie is like a fascinating character in the world of professional wrestling. Like, you know, by the time that he was a manager in the late 70s, early 80s, he had already been in the business for like almost 25 years. Uh, he was primarily like a, a California star, uh, primarily a heel, but one of those people that like he becomes like such a big heel that he becomes a baby face. He was a regular on the Dobie Gillis show. <laughs> I'm sad that I know Dobie, what that is. Right. I know you remember what that Dobie is from Gillis Nick from Nick at yeah. Night, right? 
Uh, he was like oh, a recurring me. character. <laughs> he was a recurring character on that. Um, the precursor to Johnny Carson Tonight Show, but in between. So it's Steve Allen, someone else, and then Johnny Carson. The in between person between Steve Allen and Johnny Carson was Joey Bishop. Okay. Joey Bishop's Ed McMahon was Freddie Blassie's really good friend, Regis Philbin. Okay. So Freddie Blassie would always be on the Joey Bishop show in like the late 50s, early 60s. And he had like a whole thing where like he like legit would file his teeth um, so that like he could quote unquote like cut people open with his jagged teeth. <laughs> um, he was one of the first um, Americans to go over to wrestle in Japan and not be like a total heel, even though he's a huge heel in America when he went over to Japan. And again, you have to remember we're less than 10 years removed from world war two. Um, so Americans in Japan were always universally booed, but there was just something about Fred Blassie when he went over to Japan, he was like a baby face in like mm. the late fifties, early sixties. So he's a fascinating character. You know, he's got his ties to Andy Kaufman and stuff like that. But if you don't know stuff about Freddie Blassie, like he's a really interesting character in the history of professional wrestling. Yeah. Like I honestly don't, I, like I just know what the WWE showed me in like recaps and like hall of fame stuff. And like you mentioned doing voiceovers towards the, the end of his life. But yeah, I don't know much about him. And uh, last but not least uh, on this day in 2019, uh, Lyle Williams passed away. Now, if you've ever gone to an independent wrestling show in Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, from 1999 to his passing, Lyle was one of the cameramen at every Chikara show, CZW show, Dragon Gate USA, Evolve shows. And Lyle was one of the nicest guys in the world. Just an unbelievably warm person someone who loved professional wrestling um he was a he was a lifelong fan um you know obviously if you can go still i think his his uh social media is still up it's you know and it gets it's lyle c williams on like whatever it is and he would post the pictures that he took but then he has like pictures of him as a young man as a teenager as a kid going to like the spectrum shows the civic center shows in oh, wow. the 70s and 80s and, you know, he's just somebody who's really respected in professional wrestling. He's kind of, you know, he's spoken of in the same breath as someone like Smart Mark Gary, you know? Okay. Yeah. Uh, someone who, you know, obviously, like, someone who just maybe wasn't athletic for whatever reason, but was just a lifelong fan of professional wrestling. And this is the thing that I could do, which was photography. And this is my way of going to give back. Um, and... Lyle, and it was, you know, very sudden. I, I remember, you know, he, he was sick and he posted some updates on his Facebook that he was going to the hospital. It's probably nothing. And then it was like less than 40 out, 48 hours later and he was gone. Oh, shit. That's yeah. Awesome. And Lyle was just like one of the nicest guys in the world, sorely missed um, by everyone. Anyone that knew him, anyone that saw him at shows. He was always someone that had just a nice word to say about anyone and everyone. He loved wrestling. And uh, he's another one, like I said, go search out his stuff because I think it's all out there on social media. Um, you know, Twitter and Facebooks and, you know, Instagrams and whatever. He had all the accounts. I think they're still all out there, obviously. You know, his family didn't, like, update them or deactivate them and stuff. But just to kind of look at his work and look to see the stuff that he was ringside for, um, you know, just in the last, like, 20 years – and then the stuff as a fan that he was a part of and got to meet and got to see over the last like 40 years of his life. Uh, but Lyle was awesome. And uh, again, sadly missed. And again, to see, you know, and, and that's the thing when we, when deaths come up and their anniversaries of someone's passing, um, you know, and there's a couple of them together, it's always nice to kind of reminisce about the stuff that they did in the world of professional wrestling, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. Sounds like yeah. a good dude. All right, so let's get into more recent stuff. Let's talk about the last seven days of the world of professional wrestling. Uh, a lot of stuff happened. What would you like to talk about, Adam? All right, well, first things first. All right, <laughs> on to number two. 
Uh, all right. I was I technically I've been ready for number two for a little bit, but I wanted to wait until the change of the segment. Um, I want to just start things off with talking about AEW Double or Nothing. Not one thing in particular. I'm sure if there's something in your talking points or if something kind of jumps out at you and you want to, you know, talk more about it by all means. But I can nitpick. But I will just say, like, it was a very, very enjoyable pay-per-view. Uh, I'm not even going to say it was super long, because I think if you're having a good time watching wrestling or watching anything else, if it's long, I don't care. I don't have a bedtime. I got nowhere to be the next day. You can go on as late as you want. But um, just a couple of things that stand out for me. Uh, obviously, the pre-show with Hookhausen killing poor Marky and Tony Nese. Good time. <laughs> The Death Triangle versus House of Black, I had said that that was the thing I was looking most forward to uh, going into the pay-per-view, and it did not disappoint. And then we got Spooky Julia Hart, so that's awesome. Anarchy in the Arena was just a cool train wreck of a match, but the visual of Eddie Kingston pretty oh. much dead, stumbling down to ringside carrying a gasoline container then pouring it on Chris Jericho and Brian Danielson and then Danielson losing his fucking mind on Eddie Kingston. One of my favorite moments in wrestling in like years. I love that. Uh, Tay Conti in a Malefic uh, Maleficent. I don't know in that, <laughs> in that Disney costume. Uh, and then the debut of Stokely Hathaway. So there was a lot of cool things on this pay-per-view and yeah, you could be like, Oh, the, the Owen tournament was predictable or we can complain that Jurassic express still has the tag titles, which sucks. makes no sense. But overall, I, I thought I had a really good time watching the pay-per-view, uh, the hangman punk match, say what you want. You know, punk will be a good champ. Uh, even though he's stealing the, the summer of Adam thing, I don't like this, but I had a good time watching the pay-per-view. Uh, so, yeah, so I like the pay-per-view, too, and let me kind of pull this up here. Uh, what was this called? Uh, Double or Nothing. Double or Nothing. Yep. So, uh, so it was a long pay-per-view, right? Sure. Um, I mean, but we come, we, we've come to the understanding that an AEW pay-per-view is going to be long to begin with, right? Yeah. Uh, I give you the buy-in, right? What I would have done is I would have moved the six person and the Kyle O'Reilly and Dar Darby Allen to the pre-show and put more matches on the pre-show to suck people in, right? Sure, or just to cut them all together. <laughs> or something, right? Yeah, yeah. But the pay-per-view as it is, you needed your opener with Wardlow beating MJF. Yeah. Um, You could have just had maybe... a a little bit more of a school. Like there's no reason that Jade Cargill and Anna J should have went seven minutes. Oh, all right. Could have been a squish. Then you have the deal where Athena comes out and then you have the deal where Stoke Stokely Hathaway comes out. Okay. Yeah. Poor Marky, but go on. Um, but like, so outside of that, like you could have skipped one, two, three, four, five matches because sadly, like, after the Wardlow MJF stuff, which was more of an angle than anything else, the pay-per-view really doesn't pick up until, like, the Kyle O'Reilly Darby Allen match. What do you mean by pick up? Which was awesome. Well, the, the House of Black versus Death Triangle match was awesome. It was good. It was awesome. It was Come awesome. on, man. You're such a nitpicker. That was such a I'm great match. I'm not a nitpicker. It was just fine. You know what I, I mean? Think... Like, I think those guys could do better. I liked... Didn't they have an eight man that was on the the last buy in that uh, Eric Rowan was in? Uh possibly. I seldom watch buy ins. Yeah, I but, think I like that one more than this one. Uh I don't know. Like the obviously, I think that you're kind of uh, turned off by the fact that the match ended with Spooky Julia Hart. No, you no, know, I was okay taking some that. steam. Like I yeah. knew that was going to happen. It had to happen. You know. Yeah. I don't know. I like that match a lot. Yeah, it was all right. All right. But like I said, I, uh, Kyle versus um, Darby way over delivered. And then like the last like four matches were fantastic. You know, I thought the Thunder Rosa and Serena Deeb was really good. Um, I think that just over delivered is all it did. Yeah. Like low expectations. Um, you know, the, the anarchy in the arena match was awesome. One of the greatest moments of all time. <laughs> uh, Matt Menard loves the business more than all of us. 
<laughs> uh, I and I think uh, if, uh, I don't think he listens to this podcast, but uh, friend, regardless, Adam Lash says that he hopes that this is something that Matt Menard could show his son when he gets older to show how much his father loved professional wrestling. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I'd be hard pressed to disagree with that. The triple threat for the tag match was really good. Um, you know, obviously, I you know I don't love luchasaurus really i think jungle board's really good but you know the like i it didn't like the it didn't make the match like not good because the wrong team won right i mean it didn't make the match not good but it made it less memorable in my yeah opinion. okay there it's you just go a very forgettable match now um because like the coolest motherfuckers on the planet didn't win it and that could go for either of the other teams you know right and uh, the main event, like Punk and Hangman, like I'm not a Hangman Page guy, I'm not a Punk guy. I, yeah, I, I see the plus. <laughs> what? Yes, you are. <laughs> I see the pluses and minuses of both characters. Um, I was pitching like this big crazy angle that was going to happen. None of that shit happened. It just Punk won the title. Went to the presser and was uh, shocked by the things that a very awake Tony Khan was saying at 1:30 in the morning. Lots of Red Bulls for Tony, I think. Is That's what it right. Was. Yeah. He's <laughs> five he took, hours. He, take, he took over the uh, Matt Menard uh, Red Bull and uh, pepperoni sticks diet that he had in Chikara, you know? <laughs> yes. Yeah. But the pay-per-view was good, man. Like I said, you know, it's a little long, but it was still good. Yeah. Like I said, I, I really enjoyed it. There's things, there were lulls in it, you know, run to the bathroom here or there. But uh, overall, like a really good show, a really sure. good show. Uh, not to tip my hand at all for a segment come up later. Uh, but like compare that to a WWE pay-per-view that I just don't give a shit about. So I'm not even going to watch, you know. Uh-huh. But what about you? What's something uh, that maybe got you all worked into a shoot this past week? The MJF promo on TV. <laughs> I don't know if you want to talk about it. I mean, it is setting the wrestling world on fire. I've seen in certain wrestling uh, Facebook groups that it might be the greatest promo to ever be said by a wrestler, Joe. These are people that just started watching wrestling for the last 10 years. <laughs> and these listen, are pe- these are people that proudly show off their Alberto Del Rio Mark photos. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, Marty Skrull's coming to uh, Collector's Universe? Sign me up. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so, I've said, I've been a detractor of MJF, but I like MJF. I think yeah. MJF is better than what you've seen in AEW, and people think, like, from his AEW, he's like this god character, right? Yeah, and I've always like I think that you've been harder on him than I have. Yeah, you know, like if you've if you've given him a solid C, you know, with a couple <laughs> B pluses mixed in there, I might have given him a solid B, you know. But go on. And I, I I can't. And I've always said that everyone thinks he's like this great promo, right? Mm-hmm. And I've said that he's maybe good for like two out of every five promos. Yeah, you know, and this was definitely not one of those two. <laughs> his, he was very passionate. Um, his delivery was good. His delivery was good. The material was bad. Uh, the crowd got into him, but that crowd was super hot for everything. But again, I'm not using that to hand wave uh, what this is. But you're talking to someone, and I am ashamed to admit this, but we were. if you were a fan of wrestling in the Attitude Era, you were led to believe that everything was a shoot, and everything was a work, and the boys in the back, and the shoot names, and the everything else, right? Yeah, I, I was a fan of your checklist, but go on. Right. <laughs> so there was a there was a period of time, like, when I was sitting at home watching Over the Edge 1999, and they told me that Owen Hart had passed away. Yeah. I thought it was a work. Yep, because it's like you were just trained to not trust anything. Right. (laughs) So we were trained to be immediately suspect of anything that we see on TV. Mm -hmm. Then a few months later, Russo goes to WCW, and then all bets are off, right? Everything's a work. Everything's a shoot. uh, Everything that you saw on the show before was fake, except for this part is real, um, cause I'm wearing my giants Jersey, but I'm also <laughs> reading from the golden rod pages in the script. 
not the magenta pages in the script. We're throwing the script out. I'm going to reference internet stuff that doesn't get over. I've been here before. I've yeah. seen it all for the last 23 years. You're not going to do anything that gets me to give a shit about your fake bullshit work shoot angles. When yeah. per- Go ahead. I was going to say, we've said this before, and all the shows on the soon-to-be-named network have said this before, that so many fans only know uh, wrestling based on the WWE post WCW going out of business, ECW going out of business. So all they know is like the world of sports entertainment. They don't remember any of this stuff because it was before their time. So like all of this work shoot brother stuff is completely original and mind blowing to all these people because they have no context. So if you take a sampling of a hundred wrestling fans, right? Yeah. I'm going to say you're probably going to get, I'm being generous and this is my skewed world set. 15 people that have been watched that watched wrestling prior to 1995. Yeah. Okay. Then with that 85% that's less, and this is in supposed to math of that (laughs) 85% that's left, you got maybe another 60 that have only been watching since 2001, 2002. The rest of them have only been watching maybe for the last 10 years since the CM Punk pipe bomb promo. So it's even less exposure to all this other bullshit that we're also conditioned to. Yeah. Like none of these people ever like lived through the Brian Pillman stuff. You know? Right. Right. You, you, they never lived through the Brian Pillman stuff. They never lived through Shane Douglas throwing down the NWA title. They never lived through like the different invasion things, people jumping from one show to another, because this is something that's only been happening now for the last three years to these people, as opposed to, we mentioned earlier in the show, 1985 or 1984 junkyard dog leaves mid South professional wrestling. And they spend the next two weeks of TV showing old matches of him losing to people that are still in the territory and burying them saying that he left for uh, less uh, tough competition. He wasn't, he he couldn't cut it here, you know? Yeah. So, and and if this sounds to Jim Cornette, then so be it, right? Mm -hmm. In professional wrestling, we joke on the soon to be named network, Longbox Heroes, when did blank become a business, right? (laughs) Yeah. Wrestling is a business. Wrestling exists, yes, to entertain, to have five star matches so on and so forth. But the real reason that that wrestling exists is to make money. Not for me, not for you, it's for to get our money from us, right? Yep. It's to get that money into the promoter's pocket. And then he could dole it out to the boys. And that's kind of sort of what this MJF shoot thing is about. And it's not a shoot, it's all fake. It's always been a work the whole time. This stuff over the weekend where he doesn't show up to the meet and greet. And then Sean Ross Sapp, who never gets worked, but got worked like three times in the last like five days in regards to all this bullshit. He heard it from a very reliable source. And again, I could get I could bet who that real reliable <laughs> source is when he's lighting his foot on fire at a fucking show the same weekend. Uh, <laughs> that being said, MJF bought a plane ticket, but he didn't get on the plane ride. He hasn't been sighted at the building. They're moving his match to the first match just because they finally got him here and they're afraid he's going to leave. So on and so forth. All of this has been an elaborate work. Yeah. I'm excited. He took his shirts off of Shop AEW. Right. I'm Wait excited for the six months from now episode of Talk is Jericho where MJF and Tony Khan sit down and lay out how this whole angle has been worked out for the last year, right? Yeah, and pat themselves on the back. So anything that happens on TV storyline-wise is I like this guy. I want to see him win. I'm going to pay money so I could be there or see the pay-per-view when he wins. I don't like this guy. I don't like this guy so much. I'm going to buy the pay-per-view. I'm going to buy the ticket. I'm going to go to the live event so I can see this guy lose. I like this guy so much. I want to see him win the title. I'm going to follow this person and I'm going to buy their merchandise because I want to support this person and spend my money to support this person, devoting my time 
to see this person I like succeed, win a title, beat a, win a feud, whatever. Or I don't like this person so much, I want to see them get beat, hopefully, by the guy that I like really good. And I'm saying guy, guy, girl, whatever, right? Sure. So if we're to believe what is being presented to us as real in the MJF angle, MJF is mad that Tony Khan, who he'll never wrestle, is paying people to leave WWE more money than they're paying MJF. Now, I had it pointed out to me. It's like, well, rich people want more money. Okay. MJF is a bad guy. Do I want to see this bad guy get more money? No. I, I kind of want to see this bad guy fail. Mm -hmm. I, I want to see him lose, right? Yeah. And if this was supposed to be like his baby face turn, his baby face turn was full with lies and him insulting us and very like uneven like stuff. And the other thing that he says is like everybody else got handed whatever to come into AEW. And if you remember the early AEW stuff, MJF, we were led to believe by Cody, one of the people who were in charge, like the face of the company, EVP, that okay. MJF was his hand-picked guy. Yeah. So now that Cody's gone, two weeks ago, we could talk about Cody all we want, but today we can't, that we're supposed to forget that Cody would go and do press and talk about how MJF is going to be this great baby face for the company. That way do you see what he could do? I know what MJF could do. He's going to be great. He's my hand-picked guy and all this other bullshit. So, like, we're supposed to forget about that. And then, if we're supposed to believe that MJF is rich and he just wants more money, I think there was a different way to go about this. You know, I, I think I postulated to someone that, like, he could set something up where it's like, well, I'm going to prove to you, Tony Khan, that you're wasting your money on these WWE guys. I claim I'm so good. Put me in the ring with everyone who gets paid more than me, and I will beat them. And I will show you in the ring where I'm the best that you're wasting your money on these WWE guys, right? Yeah. I, I get you, Joe, but here's the thing. You're using logic that makes sense for professional wrestling, that's a great wrestling storyline. Yes. But the reason why these people are eating this up is because this is this is unscripted, Joe. And no, if it's he not. Said, I know, but that's the thing is that these people think that, or even if they don't think it that, they want to believe it. So, like, what you're saying is a perfectly plausible thing that fits into his character, and it would make sense. But it would not get that segment of fandom to be in such a fervor. You know what so I'm saying? Let me, and I'm not let agreeing me, with them. Let me put it this way. I do not believe in his conviction, in the words he said, in anything that was said in that promo on Wednesday night of a word of what MJF said. I don't believe any of it. I'm but he said 100, fuck. Huh? <laughs> but he said fuck. <laughs> I'm 100% convinced that it's fake. Okay? Yeah. Oh, I mean, it, obviously it is. However, I am 100% convinced that Eddie Kingston wants to set Chris Jericho on fire. <laughs> I've told you before that Eddie Kingston is one of the five professional wrestlers that I am legit scared of in real life. Okay, so Eddie Kingston, fake wrestling angle with fireballs and blade jobs and ECW crowd brawling. But when Eddie Kingston talks and Eddie Kingston comes out with a can of gasoline, I believe he's really going to kill Chris Jericho. <laughs> when MJF comes out and takes his scar scarf off and says, this is Maxwell Friedman talking to you, I oh, don't believe a lick of it. Don't yeah. believe a lick of it, right? Yeah. <laughs> There's something endearing. There's something that connects about an Eddie Kingston. There's something that's not endearing that doesn't connect about MJF, and that's where the problem lies. And if MJF connects with you, or if MJF is your friend and you want to play along, that's great. Eddie Kingston's my friend. Do I want to play along? I'd like to play along, but I really think he wants to set Chris Jericho on fire. Yeah. And I'm too scared of him to find out, you know? Right. <laughs> Even though he's privately told me he doesn't, when he comes out on TV, I'm like, ooh, he's going to do it tonight. <laughs> 
so I'm not doing this to harsh your buzz. I was live tweeting with the show. This is my opinion. I'm an old man. I'm let's hopefully they could course correct this and maybe make some sense out of this. And I'll even go you one better, Adam. Okay. Yeah. If we're supposed to believe this is MJF thing is real and he wants Tony Khan to fire him. Okay. Would Tony Khan have given MJF 15 minutes of uncensored mic time on his nationally televised TV show that we even are told that the heads of the network are there for? And if MJF really wanted to be fired from his job, like, listen, I've never been fired from a job, but I know a lot of people that have been fired from their jobs. Um, (laughs) You know, one, you could just stop showing up. And eventually you'll be in breach of contract and you'll be fired. Uh, Two, when uh, uh, Mustafa Ali wanted to get out of his contract, uh, obviously there's nothing like this in MJF or in in, uh, AEW as far as I know. I don't know if you heard me wink into the thing. (laughs) Um, But like, hey, Mustafa Ali, if you want to get fired, just start tweeting about Mel Phillips or start tweeting about Jimmy Snuka, or start tweeting about all the other horrible things that Vince McMahon has done his entire life. And I'm sure there's people in AEW that have done horrible things that they just sweep under the rug and don't talk about. You could mm-hmm. start publicly disparaging the company, and you will get fired. You can go and commit crimes. Okay, maybe you don't want to commit crimes. You can go and start doing drugs. You could show up to the building under the influence of whatever. And if it's 1997, they'll put the tag team titles on you. It's Stone Cold Steve Austin. But (laughs) what I'm saying is if MJF really wanted to get fired from his job, going on national TV and getting 15 minutes of uninterrupted microphone time was not the way to do it. (laughs) I, I will just say, and we can like wrap this up, but like you mentioned, oh, maybe they'll course correct this, you know, in the following week. But here's the thing, Joe, the people that they wanted to fool and by, you know, I use that term very loosely, the people that they wanted to pop or string along with this angle, they're already bought in. They're hooked. You know, they believe that this is the greatest promo ever. So they don't need to change anything because you and I don't matter. It's the people that are going on Twitter and being like, holy shit, MJF just changed wrestling. Those are the people that they want to appease. So there's nothing to course correct. For us, yeah, maybe, like you mentioned, they need to do something different. I'd love to see MJF just start retweeting like WWE shit. I think that would be funny. But uh, at the end of the day, there's nothing for them to change because the the marks that they wanted to uh, like hook on this, they already got. And we mentioned before with Brian Pillman, when Brian mm-hmm. Pillman was doing his shoot stuff in WCW, I respect you, Booker Man and stuff. Yeah, they mentioned at the dark side of the ring, crazy like a fox. Brian Pillman said, "If we want people to really believe that you fired me." You should give me my release. (laughs) And then Bishop said, that's a great idea. Let me do that. And then he immediately went and negotiated with WWF. Yeah. So let's see if, uh, let's see if, uh, Tony wants to do that. (laughs) (sighs) (laughs) All right, Joe, I think I hit a nerve there. Uh, so I just want to say, I'm going to pull up a tweet from a friend of yours. At Trevor Dame. Ooh. Okay. And his tweet says, uh, MJF, quote, Well, Marks, if you look at the metrics I draw, the second best quarter hour ratings on average, and I should be paid commiserate with free agents from blah, 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 blah. And then Miro, I'm going to find God and murder him. (laughs) So my other talking point is the fact that Miro returned. I fucking love Miro, man. Like the... The promo where he's basically like, my neck of sand has been healed, but my heart is broken. (laughs) Like, I love everything about these. I've been a mark for these uh, God's Redeemer promos for a while. I'm happy to see him back. Maybe he'll bring in CJ Perry. I don't know. But I'm very happy to see Miro back on Dynamite. Yeah, Miro's awesome. Uh, That was really cool. Um, It was a nice surprise to see him back. And I would be repressed. I also want to mention uh, Aaron Quinn, 
who uh, I competed with and lost on an episode of Five Star Match Game. Uh, she tweeted out, Miro wants to fight God, another example of WF Castoffs feuding that MJF is so mad about. Because remember when <laughs> Vince and Shane fought God and Shawn Michaels on uh, that one pay-per-view? Yeah, of course. Yes. Another another former WF star again, getting another w, uh, AEW payday. <laughs> nice. But yeah, this is short and sweet. I'm just happy that Miro came back. That was my, uh, obviously Stokely's awesome, Athena's awesome, but I was happy to see Miro back on TV. Yep. That's really all I got. I'm all, I'm all worn out from the MJF discourse. <laughs> all right, Joe. Well, did you know, despite all this AEW talk, there's a WWE pay-per-view this weekend. A premium live event? Oh, my it's apologies. Sammy Zane's taking down to the ring. It's Kofi Kingston doing his thing. Ruby Soho. Beyond the show. Brian Danielson. No, no, no. Is it the big dog's yard? Let's find out. It's Joe No. Probably not, but go ahead. <laughs> it could be the champion cream ale talking, but that uh, that jingle hit me this time. And speaking of which, this is the one that's been leaking, so we'll see how this one tastes. Sure. Um, according to Wikipedia, the most trusted source of wrestling information, Joe, WWE is putting on Hell in a Cell this weekend. And just like all good pay-per-views, Joe, six matches have been announced as of today. Six? Six. Okay. Uh, I am sure they will hastily throw together another six matches on SmackDown tomorrow. But, Joe, do you know the card? So that's the thing. I, I vaguely know the card. And when I was, like, picturing it in my head, I'm like, there's no SmackDown matches on this card, right? See, I don't know the difference between Raw Superstars and SmackDown. Yeah, players. I think, like, the line is pretty much blurred at this point, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I know we got Cody and uh, Seth Rollins in Heck in a Sack. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. We got uh, Bianca versus Becky versus Asuka. Yep, that's two. Uh, do we have Bob Lashley versus Omos again? Close. Try it again. Uh, handicap match with MVP? Correct. Bobby Lashley versus almost an MVP. Ugh, poor MVP. <laughs> uh, then we have a six-person tag of whatever Edge's group is called. Judgment um, Day. Edge, Damian Priest, and Rhea Ripley. Against, House of Black from Wish. Right, against Bullet Club 2022. <laughs> <laughs> of AJ Styles, Finn Balor, and Liv Morgan? Yep. That's four. That's, that's four. I know we have Kevin Owens versus uh, Ezekiel. That's five. And that's all I got. Uh, pretty close. Pretty close. The last match is Theory versus Mustafa Ali. Oh, good for Ali getting a pay-per-view or a premium live event match. <laughs> yeah, for the United States Championship. But we have no tag title match. Nope. We have no uh, Roman Reigns match. I know Roman isn't going to be doing the B-level pay-per-views these days. Yeah, nor should he. But I assume uh, we should have an Usos versus someone match. But would Orton be in Hurt? That's kind of up in the air. Do you think they're going to do um, Usos against Nakamura and Riddle? They've been kind of teasing that on TV. I wouldn't know. I haven't watched WWE in a couple weeks. Okay. <laughs> I'll say this. You want me to tune in to Heck in a Sec, announce and give it a graphic that we're going to get the first named person in uh, the Maximum Male Models with uh, Max <laughs> Dupree. <laughs> or give us an Alexa Bliss match. You know, mm. you want to get me in there. Fair enough. But as this pay-per-view stands right now, uh, I don't know about you, Joe. Uh, there is nothing on here I want to see. Cody versus Seth has the uh, potential to be very funny. <laughs> How because so? it's it's going to be Cody in a cage match, and you're not allowed to bleed in World Wrestling Entertainment. <laughs> okay. See, I, I feel like I saw their match at Mania, and I was like, okay, I can check off Cody Rhodes versus Seth Rollins. I don't need to see it again. But the fact that it's in a hell in a cell... 
I'm sorry, heck in a sec. Eh, maybe. Yeah. But, but you got to sell me on it. You know, I don't know. And if they do a uh, straight comedy with uh, Kevin Owens and Ezekiel, I think I'd be okay with that. Yeah, but that's what you want, so you won't get it. Yeah. It's Fingers <laughs> crossed, you know? Yeah. All right. Well, I'm sure they'll add two or three or four more matches tomorrow, as we mentioned. Yeah, and like I said, world, you know, world, uh, like, these are competent performers that could probably put on very good to great wrestling matches. But it's just such a lifeless product at this point. Yeah. All right. Speaking of lifeless, Joe, this champion cream ale that I just drank, it's the number three one, and it was the flat one. So Aww. it does not taste good. So I will I will power through it as I tell everybody that there is no show homework this weekend because of the pay-per-view and because we're going away to yes. rest. More on the wrestling later, but right now it's time for the voicemail. All right. Hey guys, it's Kevin Ford, and I am calling with some bad news. I just got a YouTube recommendation for a video on uh, the Prime Video channel, the Amazon Prime Video channel to be more specific. That includes Dana Donnelly. So I unfortunately am going to have to no longer make any purchases from Amazon, including through the click-through, which is oh. going to affect uh, both of your cuts of the fucking money. Yeah. Um, sorry. Uh, do not blame me, blame Amazon. <laughs> and, uh, this is probably the only bad decision Amazon has ever made. So I just wanted to <laughs> let you guys know that. Thanks. As some fuckers peeing in a bottle to, to keep their productivity up. Right. But yeah. <laughs> I can't imagine what decisions you made in a lifetime that made a Dana Donnelly video appear in your recommended viewings. Mm. Did you he know interact I mean? with Ed? Right. Well, I interact with Ed all the time, but like, you know what? I think you maybe need a good ad blocker, but I'll tell you, man, if I'm watching something on YouTube and a Dana Donnelly recommended thing comes up, I'm going over to Rumble. I swear to Christ. <laughs> I'm clearing my cookies. I'm clearing my cash. I'm getting it all out of there. I'm right. signing out. You know. <laughs> oh, all right. Thanks, Kevin. All right. Next up. Hello, guys. It's Arthur MacArthur, strongest man in all the land, and the exclusive home to my voicemails here at this, uh, at Arthur Wrestling. Sorry, I stumbled my words there. <clears throat> Anyways, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow we have good old, old wrestling. Coming back to Cleveland, Ohio. I'm sure you're familiar with it, Joe. Perhaps you are too, Adam. Um, I have to... But uh, beg the question then, with old wrestling, you know, we have all of these guys and their great grandparents wrestling me and it's, it's, it's great, you know, but, um, think of some of the favorite, some of your favorite independent wrestlers today and create a, a very unique, uh, gimmick for them in old wrestling or, you know, their great grandparents and all. You know, really can't wait to talk to to great the great grandfather of Zesty. You know, we're really gonna spruce it up and talk a bit. All righty, that's uh, really all I got. You know, let's let's get as creative as we can be. And uh, yeah, you guys have a blessed weekend. And oh yes, Adam, I definitely uh, appreciate you taking the toys out of those packages. I mean, there's no real value in a box toy when you can't play with it. All right, goodbye, guys. All right, well, first things first, a couple things to take out of this call. Thank you, Artie, for calling. Second of all, Joe, you have to announce that you're about to hit the sepia button whenever Arthur MacArthur calls. Third, Artie, uh, I get it. When you were a kid, toys were just like, what, a rock and a stick? Maybe like a crudely whittled train or something like that. But nowadays toys, you know, you keep on packaging because they're not, they're a lot nicer looking, but uh, I don't know. Like Joe, who do you want to turn into in like an old person? I don't know what his call was about. <laughs> well, okay. So what toys were you sending out to already? Are you sending him stuff? No, I, I had done the episode of ruin the fig which is exclusive to the Porch Talk Patreon. Right. And I had unboxed uh, two Azrael figures to send off to friend of the show and Scotty Pippen of Azrael Figure Collecting, Scott uh, Shane Hagedorn. 
I can't imagine there were any good sniffs in an Azrael figure. I'll just say that. <laughs> well, they were pretty old, so it did smell like 1994. <laughs> so, so I want to just say this before I answer Artie's question and kind of give you a little explanation here. So yeah. when the the uh, the voicemails come in to uh, the Google number, you know, uh-huh. they, they put a transcript or as close of a transcript uh, as they can get. And I want you to read what it translated Artie's name as. <laughs> Hello, guys. It's awesome, MacArthur. <laughs> Strongest man in all the land. Nice. Awesome right. MacArthur. So that's the episode title, by the way. Awesome MacArthur. <laughs> MacArthur. Uh, so old wrestling is, it's like everyone's like old timey, like maybe like the 40s, maybe like the 50s, right? Maybe sometimes okay. we pretend that it's like the our, like the wrestlers that we know of today, like their grandparents, and we're watching this all through like an old timey filter, right? Okay, I get it. And obviously Artie fits because he's already an old, like an old-timey strong man in today. So back then he's just a strong man, not an old-timey strong man, right? Sure, but they're all doing a bit. This is actually real art. art sure, like sure. Shoot. Yeah, but go ahead. So then you have people, I think, like PME or like Shine Boys. Um, I think when uh, Ruby Soho was still on the indies and she would wrestle at those events, like she was like a newsie and stuff. Okay. So what I would do is, uh, in that, right? So we're going back to like the 30s, 40s, 50s. I would take someone from today who does kind of like a 90s or 80s style gimmick and just have them be there as their current gimmick because they're already out of place in today's timeline. They go back to like 30s, 40s, 50s, and it's a back to the future sort of situation. Like they're essentially Marty McFly, 80s oh, okay. kid in the 40s, 50s, or whatever it is, right? All right, I'm cl- I am laying claim right now to the wild child of the 80s, Tony Storm. <laughs> there you go, right. <laughs> I want to see her in that old time wrestling. So like who to give that to, of course, like. I'll be honest with you, I haven't seen the latest old wrestling shows to know where, like, everyone's allegiances line up. You know, um, I know there's people that are, like, old-timey judges, and there's people that are, like, your Lone Ranger-style bandits and stuff like that. So there's a lot to play with there. But it's not like, oh, well, their character today is this, so tomorrow it's going to be that. Like, I'm just saying, as an example, like, if you took someone like Bobby Orlando, right? Uh-huh. who has a very, like, 90s look and 90s feel to him. And you just took him as is and dropped him into old wrestling. Like, he's like, what am I doing here? I don't understand. And then everyone else is confused by him. Like, he wants a tab, and they're like, well, I can't give you a tab unless you buy something. <laughs> that sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's the reverse new breed. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Thanks for the call, Artie. Thank you, Artie. Have fun at the wrestling this weekend. Be good. Yeah. Stay out of trouble. Next call. Hey, guys. It's Wayne in Missouri. Almost missed my call this week. Uh, SmackDown time this week, 28 minutes, 49 seconds. The majority of that was taken up by the uh, Sami Zayn, Kevin Owens segment. Quite frankly, if they just put those guys on for two hours every week, I'd be quite content. Um, another 60 seconds of the uh, greatness that is Max Duke. Pre. There you go. Um, also wanted to mention, I had never given him enough screen time to notice, but I noticed this week when I actually slowed down and watched seconds of him that Riddle bears a resemblance to the old Stretch Armstrong dolls, and now I can't unsee that. <laughs> Talk to you next week. Bye. Thank you, Dwayne. Uh, Joe, I'll just get this out of the way before you pull up your calculator. Uh, zero seconds of SmackDown this week. No, I'm 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 ready to go. I took my notes in advance. Ooh. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna round up and say 11 minutes. Okay. Uh, only it all worked out because the Max Dupree segment was right <laughs> before the Sami Zayn Kevin Owens segment. So I was able to roll those two right into each other. And yeah. uh, tip of my John Cena cap to uh, Pat McAfee. So they play, they do the Max Dupree segment. I'm sorry, Max Dupree. You wouldn't know who I was talking about <laughs> if I didn't say it that way. Exactly. They do that segment and then they come to Kevin Owens' entrance and McAfee says, oh, I, you know, I know that Max Dupree is a wild man. I spent some crazy nights in L.A. with him. 
Ah, and I'm like, yeah, that was for it. me, Pat McAfee. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Next week, if Pat McAfee says that he was uh, at the Maxim Mail Models offices in Hagerstown, Maryland, then everything's even better, you know? Yeah. Now, Joe, I, I don't know if I asked you this or not, because, again, I am three Dan, uh, Dan Champion Ales deep in this, but uh, if they announced an either an L.A. Knight or a Max Dupree figure, would you buy it? Elite, yes. Basic, no. Fair enough. I respect that. Yeah. All right. Next call. Next call. Hey, guys. It's Kevin. Um, I don't know about you, but I've had an absolutely shit, awful, horrible week. So I'm trying to think of something positive, something light, something to bring joy to the universe again. Uh, AEW Double or Nothing was very good. I very much enjoyed Dynamite uh, when I finally got to watch it today, Thursday. Um, but that's rare to enjoy shows to that level. Um, if you were at a bar, or restaurant, friend's house, and AEW was on the past couple of days, you might get some people interested in it. Uh, you know, random friend, family member, uh, if you just start dating someone, like you could get them interested. But we've all had times where someone knows we're a wrestling fan, wrestling's on TV, and it's just the absolute worst, most embarrassing, horrible thing, and you're ashamed to be a fan. So I was just wondering if either of you had any story of you had non-wrestling fan company or you were with non-wrestling fans, they know you're a wrestling fan and something horrible comes on the TV and they give you a look like, how can you justify this? Uh, so hopefully some good answers, a uh, little chuckle uh, when I listen to either tonight or tomorrow. And here's to next week being better. Bye. Oh, man, I I honestly don't know if I have an example of this because generally I don't have just random people like walking in as I watch wrestling. You know what I'm saying? Like uh, if somebody's watching wrestling with me, they're probably a wrestling fan, you know? Now, Joe, yeah. you could probably ask this better because you have April and Asa walking in, you know? Well, so, okay, so I'll, I'll give you that, right? So April was a wrestling fan. That's kind of how we met and, you know, got to know each other and start dating. And, like, here we are now some, you know, 22 years later coming up next month, right? Yeah, big flex. Go on. Right. All right, listen. <laughs> I, I can, you know? Um, yeah. So she's not a fan now. Um, well, Joe, did you show her the MJF shoot promo? No, I did that not. Might, that might bring her back. It's the greatest um, promo of all time. I'm just trying to think. So there have definitely been times pre WWE Women's Revolution where there'd been like a gravy bowl match or some shit like that that was on. Yeah. And, you know, my wife, no longer a fan, comes in and she's just like, it's what wrestling is now. And I'm like, <laughs> so-and-so's on in the next segment. Or like, blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? Like, making excuses for it, right? Yeah. Um, Nothing that my kid would be embarrassed about. Like, you know, I, 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 there's been times where I tried to rope him into it. And then as he got a little bit older, he would lie and say, like, oh, I'm watching wrestling because I want to, you know, I want to stay up and watch wrestling with dad. So, no, I just want to stay up. Yeah, and he's on his tablet or his phone, you know? Yeah. But, like, I grew up in a wrestling household, you know, like, whether, like, everybody went through their peaks and valleys, but I was always consistently a fan. There was nothing that they could have walked in on me watching wrestling-wise and I'd be embarrassed of because it's fucking wrestling. They're aware. Whether yeah. they were fans before and it's now, like, the 93, 94, 95 stuff, or it's now, like, Attitude Era stuff and there's, like, Sable segments and all this other shit, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, my, my family kind of had seen it all, you know? Yeah. Same thing. It was like, if I'm watching wrestling with my friends, they're mutually embarrassed with me. If something bad is happening on television, that's all. Yeah, for sure. All right. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Hopefully everything's going all right, man. Yeah. Kevin messaged me. I haven't talked to you in a while. Exactly. Uh, so we got another one that came in a little bit late, and you've set a precedent that you allow calls to come in late, and I don't <laughs> like that, right? <laughs> well, I don't do any of the work, so it's okay. <laughs> All right, next call. Hello, Joe. Hello, Adam. And hello, the At Odds with Wrestling Universe. 
Justin Summers here from Wrestling Cheers. So do you guys have any plans this weekend? Doing anything fun and exciting on Friday and Saturday? Yeah, me neither. Think I'm just going to stay home, watch some movies maybe, and kind of take it easy. Definitely won't be leaving the state of Ohio or anything. I'll be at home, sleeping in my bed, under a roof. Definitely won't (laughs) be catching me camping anywhere this weekend. I tell you that much. Nope. Stay in Ohio and have fun. Well, also, I got into a, a fun conversation today, kind of, on TikTok. Me and a friend talking about mic skills. And Joe, I would like to get your opinion on this. I agree with you that Fuck. Eddie Kingston is the best on the mic. And no one can touch him. My friend decided to give me this list. He thinks in AEW that the following people can touch Eddie Kingston. CM Punk, John Moxley, and Samoa Joe. I think the first one is totally wrong because we've already seen Kingston murder Punk on the mic. My friend thinks Punk is holding back. I think he's not as good as he used to be. And Eddie is flat out better. A name to this list that I will add, because sometimes I do think he is close, and I'm not talking MJF, talk to Ethan Page. I think he could really have a good back and forth with him now in AEW. We already saw what they could do together at AIW. So, all right, guys, since I'm not a poor, that's why I'm reaching out to you with fancy equipment and everything, which means my call's not getting cut off, but I'll have to hear anyway. Can't wait till I see you guys again. Maybe you'll you'll come out to AIW here in two weeks. Maybe it'll even be a homework segment. Just one step closer of me ending wrestling cheers. Be that much easier. Anyway, <laughs> sucks that I won't see you guys this weekend. Hope you guys have a fun time doing whatever you're doing, whatever that might be. Later. Uh, so much to unpack there. First of all, Justin... Just a great sounding call. I don't know how you do it. Somehow your calls to the voicemail sound so much better to everybody else's. Uh, and yes, I do apologize in advance that at odds with the wrestling is becoming like the home of AIW news and reporting. But uh, it is what it is. We're taking over territories. Um, but yeah, uh, maybe... We're going to LVAC this weekend, and maybe, I don't know, I don't believe you saying you won't be there. Uh, you know, just as uh, as believable as me saying I won't be at AIW in a couple weeks, but uh, I don't know, man. Uh, as far as people touching Eddie Kingston, the implication of saying, oh, this person can't touch them means are they within reach? And I will say CM Punk at his best is within reach of Eddie Kingston. You know, uh, who else did he say other than CM Punk? Samoan Joe and John Samo- Moxley. Samoa Joe, John Moxley. I'd put those two guys ahead of CM Punk, like one notch higher. Uh, but at the end of the day, it goes back to what we were saying before, that Eddie Kingston, when he cuts a promo, you can be legitimately scared for your life. If uh, Samoa Joe said something mean in front of me, as long as I wasn't doing anything inappropriate, I would not be scared. But uh, Eddie Kingston, I would be frightened for my well-being. So I would probably put Eddie Kingston just slightly above Samoa Joe and John Moxley and CM Punk's another step below all three of them. I, I kind of echo your sem- sentiments exactly. A lot of what makes a good promo in the uh, in professional wrestling is, you know, one, it's talking people into the building, uh, making them want to see you do the thing to the person. You know, I mentioned d- during all the MJF shit before, if I like you, I want to see you. I want to I, I want you to tell me what you're going to do to the guy that I hate. Yeah. And do it in a convincing way that I believe you. Um, when Eddie Kingston says I'm going to kick someone's ass, I believe it. When John Moxley says, I'm going to kick someone's ass, I believe it. When Simone Joe says, I'm going to kick someone's ass, I believe it. Daniel Bryan, Brian Danielson, when he says it, I believe it, right? CM Punk, not so much. I think CM Punk these days cuts a much better sports entertainment promo than a, I'm going to kick your ass, come to the building to see me kick this guy's ass promo. Yeah, and I I will just kind of jump in there and disagree with you. Brian Danielson, I think I agree with you. One of, if not the greatest wrestler on the planet right now, I don't think his promos are any better 
uh, than CM Punk's right now. I don't. He doesn't have a believability in his promos. Like he delivers probably better than anybody else when the bell rings. Yeah. But from a promo standpoint, I, I'm not going to say I'm not going to put him in the Eddie Kingston, the Samoa Joe, uh, up in that tier, or the John Moxley. Uh, again, I'll give you that. And he yeah. also mentioned that uh, Ethan Page is underrated. Absolutely. Um, I think Ethan Page is not only underrated, but he's unassuming. Um, he's let a little bit of it slip out of what he has promo wise, uh, in the, in the Sammy feud. And I think he's the way he's cast on TV. He's not in a position to have that Eddie Kingston, John Moxley, Samoan Joe level promo. Um, yeah. When the day comes that Tony Khan realizes what he has with Ethan Page. Like, holy shit, man. This is, like, a really fucking good-looking dude, a great body, a great wrestler, and a great talker. I mean, what more do you want? And he collects dolls. Right. <laughs> you know? Uh, all right. But thank you, Justin. I will see you this weekend. Wink, wink. Right. All right. Pink button time. Ooh. Hey, Joe and Adam, it's Ed. I am going into the parking lot for Boston Fun right now. I'm very excited. Uh, this is my favorite time of year. Uh, super stoked. My cosplay Hayabusa, which is Hayabusa mixed with Epi, there's fish nets, and then uh, mixed with Ali Cash because I'm not a cat. Uh, just like Ali Cash. Um, but I don't know, because you can't drink with that mask, right? So I'll see how that goes Friday. I'll let you know. I'll, t- I'll take pictures. Um, but last year for this, I think I asked you guys what you would choose to do a wrestling cosplay for at an anime convention, right? But I'm going to switch it up this year, and I'm going to say, who would you choose for the other person to uh, cosplay? Uh... <laughs> if I had to choose for you guys, I I know you wouldn't be like that deep in the woods with it, right? Like you wouldn't want to uh, put a lot of effort into it. And I keep that in mind. Um, I think Joe would make a great Mr. Pogo. Um, which Adam absolutely knows who that is. Giant Japanese oh. wrestling fan. And uh, for Adam, I think you could pull off a mean Gary Hart. Uh, Joe, please explain to Adam who Gary Hart is. Um, and, uh, oh, before I go, Joe, did you... Okay. So oh, he got... you lost him. I liked a lot. Um, I think there's some things in there that can be offensive, though, it's like... Four. Um, but that means I, uh, enjoyed it. Uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna head into the convention now, and I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna drink an alcohol... <laughs> Not too many alcohols, just enough alcohols. Hey, buddy. What the fuck was going on there? Well, again, I don't know where these colossal cons are held in undisclosed locations and where the reception <laughs> is. But before we answer Ed's question, he does call back immediately. All right. Oh, I'm going to see a punk one. Real champ, baby. Real champ. CM Punk. Best of the world. Woo! Best of the world. CM Punk. Greatest of all time, baby. World champ. Fuck yeah. Let's go. Fuck yeah! <laughs> right. Oh yeah! Congratulations! Take your victory lap, Ed, on your boy becoming world champ. That's nice. The difference between Ed and Dwight is Ed's calls aren't scripted. So <laughs> allegedly, I don't know. So, uh, Adam, Gary Hart. Do you know who Gary Hart is? Uh, I assume he is a member of the Hart family. He's not. Oh, it's, it's, I you know, assumed wrong. Do you know who Sydney Bacabella is? Of course, two-time WWF Hall of Famer. If you take off the wig, that's Gary Hart. Oh, I didn't know he had a wig on. Wait I mean, uh, his 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 system. He has a system like Bobo does. That's a joke okay. only for Sydney Bacabella, who will never listen to this show. But I already tweeted at him, so. But I think uh, it's it's very clear who Adam's cosplay would be. It would obviously be cybernetically repaired uh, bicep broski. <laughs> like in a winter soldier arm or something like that? Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. See, now I'm put on the spot and I've had too many champion cream ales to know who to <laughs> say you are. And speaking of which, that's number four. <laughs> 
Now, unfortunately, I have to say to Ed, I can't be Mr. Pogo because that's too elaborate of a face paint. Yeah. Um, I would like to see what I look like in the Tarzan Goto R.I.P. Uh, yellow singlet, though. Ooh, um, I got I, one. Go ahead. I was going to say, I want you in the giant Gonzalez. Like, oh, the there you go. costume with the fur and all that, you know? I wouldn't even <laughs> need the costume. <laughs> Well, you can have the costume where there's just holes for your natural fur to come out. Oh, you know? gotcha, gotcha. All right. <laughs> you, Joe, you need the costume for the airbrush abs. Well, so do all I. Right. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, so thank, Ed, thank, thank you, everyone, you. for calling. Absolutely. Sober-ish, I guess, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's with Ed, like... Abusing substances and drinking alcohol. That's That's not cool, man. Very unlike Ed. Yes, Yes, I agree. very much so. Uh, So, hey, uh, Justin mentioned in his call, this weekend is LVAC Real Rumble 3, night one and night two, Friday and Saturday at the Mahoning Drive-In. Yes, Real Rumble Friday and Real Rumble Saturday. Right. And uh, I have the card here, uh, night one, Puff and Pancakes, accompanied by Simon Sutherland. Taking on newcomer Kit Raff and Jeff Cannonball. Uh, mm. Abby Jane taking on another newcomer, Clara uh, Carreras. Uh, we also have world famous CB taking on another newcomer, Chan- world class Channing Thomas, managed by Sydney Bacabella. Okay. And uh, main event in an eight person tag is Big Dan Champ, Rex Lawless, Murloc, and Kodama. Taking on Mach 10 Hydra, uh, Erica Lee, and the Boar. Ooh, the Boar back from a, a knee injury. Look at that. He's got the recuperative powers of a real Haas. Mr. Mister Main Event, the Boar on night one, huh? I know. Fucking doesn't leave his trailer for anything less at this point. Well, I understand at night two, he is the opener. Uh, he and Erica taking on South Philly's Finest. Uh Chris Worthless taking on Jeff Cannonball. Uh, another multi-person match. Uh, Pancakes, Green Ant. Uh, and again, they have it as Green Ant. It's Ultimo Ant now. Everybody needs to get caught up on all this shit. Uh, <laughs> for, former Green Ant, Ultimo Ant. Former Thief Ant, Electro Ant. And Mach 10 taking on Kodama, Crusher, uh, Travis Huckabee, and a mystery person, uh, it's not the commish, even though the commish is in the graphic. But if the commish is involved, I can only imagine who that mystery person is. Oh, you're going to have to call the Sposo hotline to get that That's scoop. Right. <laughs> uh, first time ever matchup as Rex Lawless takes on making his LVAC debut. Uh, former Ring of Honor everything. Uh, delirious. So that'll be a very interesting contest there. Uh, and who knows what else could happen or added or otherwise to either one of these events, especially night one or night two, yeah. rather. Sorry. No, absolutely. I mean, these shows, we've said it before, and I know we sound like corporate chills, like company guys, but these are just such a blast. I was listening to IWTV Guide this past week, and they were given the review of Bash at the Brewery. And just one of the things that they talked about was just how much fun lvac shows are and how it's like a community event and like you just feel like you you know like all the people there are just having a good vibe and that's what these uh real rumbles are like i'm looking forward to this i'll be there and i know you will be there on commentary joe uh and i will see everybody there this weekend yeah i have it on good authority that uh night one is going to be combinations of myself uh avery good professional commentator and mantis and then night two is going to be myself and mantis yeah, uh, not they are else. not being streamed live. Uh, I was in communique uh, with both Mantis and Jerry today. Uh, and unfortunately, there's just not good, good Internet connection out in the middle of the woods. <laughs> yeah. In Lehigh, in Pennsylvania, or whatever the hell the Mahoning drive in is. Yeah, um, and it's I, not like the Mahoning Drive-In is a drive-in right next to a city, like in Dixon City or Scranton. It, it right. is legitimately, there's a fucking Walmart and there's nothing else. There's like a tractor supply store nearby, but there's nothing else for like 30 miles. So, yeah, I, I'm not mad at them for not having uh, this streaming live. 
I did not get a straight answer uh, in regards to how quickly these are going to go up on Jerry's Internet Wrestling Emporium. Uh, Jerry was more concerned to tell me what the market price for wings in Tennessee are. <laughs> and but they are for, going up, right? He said that it's about it's been about the same all week. No, no, I'm not talking about the market oh. price. I'm saying oh, the shows oh. are going up. Oh, uh, yes, yes. They are going up. It's just a question of when. Yes, yes. Okay, so it's kind of like when uh, like AIW would have the shows where they just couldn't get the internet working. Yeah, and, and, and until like a superstar from TV shows up and they could figure it out. But Yeah, all of a sudden it all works out. Like if Britt Baker shows up at LVAC, all of a sudden they're going to have satellite internet set up. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. But that's awesome. So I, I, I don't glad. think it's going to be like the quick turnaround where it's like the next morning they're up, but they're going to go up, you know? Yeah, give them a couple of days of to edit out that uh that very cancelable commentary that you do oh boy <laughs> i behave i'm good you know i know what yeah, to say i know i know i'm teasing but I, dude i can't imagine like i am legitimately happy that lvac is now at least so far showing up on jerry's internet wrestling emporium you know it's pretty cool i've been saying for a while that like why hasn't this happened uh, because obviously we go to these shows live and they're available on DVD, but it's just awesome that people are able to stream it now. Oh, uh, so, and again, I, I'm sure they have no problem saying this. I think uh, Chris from LVAC has alluded to this in other podcast appearances that he's done this week and prior and so forth is he's really worried about LVAC becoming a real promotion. <laughs> and so? the the less things that real promotions do like have titles and coherent storylines and multiple storylines and a regular streaming outlet on Jerry's internet wrestling emporium, then they're going to become a real internet or a real wrestling promotion. And then they're going to be held to a much higher standard like everyone else is. All right. So first things first, LVAC, obviously there's no titles. So I give them that, but as far as coherent storylines, one of the biggest things that like held together the early LVAC shows was Ultra Mantis, Va Ultra Mantis Black. I'll try that again versus Avery Good. You know that was like a coherent storyline that lasted multiple shows. Now we have all the stuff with the Kamish uh, versus like somebody that became his intern recently. There are recurring storylines in LVAC, so somebody should let them know that. Uh, obviously, in the Dan Champion stuff. Dan Champion constantly being foiled by Orange Cassidy. Maybe Orange Cassidy is not a regular anymore, but like that's an overarching storyline. So his dreams of not becoming a real organization, they're done. They're dashed. I tried to explain it to him this weekend, but uh, he just kind of rebuffed me, you know? Yeah. Well, all they know is they know how to print good shirts. That's yeah. their strong point. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll say, so I, I'll say this out of here. Um, I think were we talking, we might have been talking in the group chat, and I immediately messaged Chris about this, that LVAC titles should be t-shirts, <laughs> but, like, very fancy, like, with, like, gold foil lettering that says, like, tag champ or, like, world champ or whatever it is. All bedazzled? No, that wasn't in my group chat, but go Okay. On. I was saying it to somebody, and he immediately yeah. rebuffed that. So, I tried. I tried. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe... Maybe it'll be a Hosser weight title, you know? Yes. Uh, Even so out listen, whoever somebody's gotta beat, Someone's got to beat the Duke and bring the boot to the East Coast, you know? Ooh. Yeah, whoever bumps the least gets a title. I think that's mm. a good good idea. Uh, so, hey, if you're coming to the shows, uh, definitely come and say hi. I'll be at the commentary table. Adam will be around. He'll be the guy in the purple jacket. You can't miss him. No, no, no. No? No, it's fucking going to be 72 and beautiful. And plus the, the purple leather jacket's been retired. Oh, boy. <laughs> it's in the closet for good. Uh, DJ and Brett from uh, We Need Wrestling are going to be there. Uh, I'm almost certain that Doug and Michelle from Wings on Wings are going to be there. Ooh, uh, Michelle, Todd what's... from uh, Longbox Heroes threatens that he's going to come, but I don't think he's going <laughs> to. Uh, so yeah, and, and Justin, uh, from Wrestling Cheers intimated that he's definitely not going to be there, so definitely don't look for him and his whole setup and his tents and his dog and everything else that he's bringing along with him. Yeah, no Wrestling Cheers this week, so I'm looking forward to a live recording. I'm holding him to that. No Wrestling Cheers, no Pod Van Dam. Guys, come on, what are you doing? 
I know all I have. I have. We need wrestling to listen to on the way down, but then I have nothing to listen to on the way back. Oh, I can sad. give you a list. I can give you a list of shit to listen to. What do you? How much time do you got? Uh, not that much. <laughs> uh, so we mentioned it before, of course. Jerry's Internet Wrestling Emporium, aka Independent Wrestling TV. Uh, use the promo code at odds. New subscriber uh, lets Jerry know that you came to us, uh, to him from us. And if you keep your subscription, we get a little bit of a kickback from Jerry uh, for that. I'm not really sure how that works. I should check with him uh, <laughs> recently to see where he's going to send me my fucking money. Um, yeah. T Public Store uh, sale not going on, but definitely go check out the designs that we have over there. Linked up through the mothership, tinyurl.com slash longboxheroes. And again, you could also help us out by making any and all of your purchases through our Amazon affiliate link. The link is in the show notes to every single one of these episodes. Uh, they, Amazon, call it an advertising fee. I call it the thing that makes Adam happy at the end of the month when he gets his cut of the fucking money. Yeah. Some of the notable purchases for the Amazon click through this past week include a DC Multiverse Arkham Knight action figure. Ooh. All right. And Are, a, you, a, are you a fan of the Arkham, uh, like... Trilogy, quadrilogy, whatever on like the video game systems, Joe? No, I am not. I, I tried to play the first Arkham Asylum game. Yeah, when Arkham Asylum, Arkham City, Arkham Origins, and then Arkham Knight. Yeah, whatever the first one was, I downloaded the demo for Xbox 360 to give you an idea of how long ago that was. <laughs> okay. And I, I couldn't figure out the controllers, and I got stuck in a corner for like five minutes, and I'm like, fuck this, I'm done. Let me go play pac uh -huh. You know? Yeah. Well, spoiler, Joe. Arkham Knight is Jason Todd. What? Kayfabe, everybody. Come on. Oh, man. I spoiled a five-year-old video game. <laughs> uh, and somebody also purchased a World Wrestling Entertainment Elite uh, figure of Murphy. Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> and he's wearing uh, the Seth Rollins shirt, uh, the same one that Jake Clemens was wearing when he was revealed to be a uh, uh, Seth Rollins disciple. Mm. Maybe people should listen to weekly purchases to find out the origins of that. But uh, interesting, interesting. Well, right, I think cool. somebody bought that figure because they bought like a bunch of ref pieces and they're going to make their own custom Jake Clemens action figure. <gasps> oh my God. That's the greatest idea ever. There you All go. Right. I'm full of I'm them. On this. I'm on this. This is that's that's fucking pretty good. All right, cool. Any other purchases? Nope, that's all. All right, but you know who should also make a Jake Clemens custom figure, Joe? These other podcasts. <laughs> and those podcasts are Longbox Heroes, Longbox Heroes After Dark, We Need Wrestling, Hit My Music, Final Wrestling Place, Porch Talk, Viewer's Choice, WWE War, Wrestling Cheers, IWTV Guide, Hellions Talks, which might get bumped from the plugs because I don't think they've had an episode in a long time. Wings on Wings featuring Todd Roker, Between the Sheets, and Pod Van Dam. And I only mention them at the end because I feel like Ed Cody right now that I'm for uh, Champion Cream Ales Deep. But that's it for plugs, Joe. All right. Well, it's now time for Adam's favorite segment of the show. Some might cost a little. Some might cost a lot. But I'm the $100 Vansky. And your figures will be bought. <laughs> Now, Joe, I'm looking at the the recording time of this Skype call, and, you know, plus or minus, we're about an hour and 40 into this. Can you imagine how much longer of a show this would be <laughs> if myself and Brett didn't do an hour-long weekly purchases episode yesterday? <laughs> well, I listened, and you still left some stuff to put in here, right? <laughs> well, I'm sure I did. Uh, and now... This is a week where I actually had a bunch of purchases. Oh, shit. We might actually be equal. I will let you start then. Okay. So uh, my birthday passed this week, whatever. Happy birthday, Joe. 
Thank you, thank you. And one of the things that I was waiting for was just in case any of them came in. And I know right now there's only four, so I only ordered four. They're on their way, and I wanted to order them from uh, MOC Masters because I really like the thickness, the yeah. heaviness of their defenders, right? Uh-huh. Um, I went and I bought four of those for those uh, Marvel Legends, like, retro figures. Okay, like the the little, like, G.I. Joe style ones, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, okay. I already have Electro and Green Goblin, the only other two that are out, because I'm only just getting the Spider-Man-related folks. There's a Venom and a regular suit Spidey that uh, once it gets past Father's Day, if I don't get them for Father's Day, I'm going to buy them myself, and I'll already have the Fig Defenders to put them in. Okay. See, Joe, I respect the fact that, like, literally everything you buy, you feel the need to put in the Defender. If I did that, I, I, I'd have to sell, like, my car. Like, I can't afford that many Defenders. But I like the fact that you're keeping everything mint on card, which is awesome. I'm trying. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, the one thing that I did not tease on weekly purchases uh, that I purchased earlier today is Amazon put up an exclusive Funko Pop of the Black Adam, which is obviously The Rock. And I don't normally mention Funko Pops on here, but that's kind of wrestling adjacent. So uh, Amazon exclusive, glow in the dark, Funko Pop, Pop of <laughs> Black Adam. So I purchased that today. <laughs> uh, it's based on the upcoming Black Adam movie? Yeah, so it's it's Black Adam with, like, a shaved head. It's basically The Rock, but it's an Amazon exclusive. Yeah, so that's still so funny because, like, you know, we're two years plus into the pandemic, and there's a bunch of movies that kind of got moved around and stuff. Yeah. But a lot of times when those, like, video games or toy lines or stuff are in the pipeline, it doesn't matter if the movie gets moved up or moved back. It's, like, too fucking bad. The toys are coming out, like, six months before the movie comes out, you know? Yeah. Like, Joe, I don't know if I ever told you this. Uh, you know how Black Widow got delayed, like, almost a year because of the yes. pandemic? The Funko Pops for that movie came out, uh, like, a year early, and they were just clogging up, collecting dust, just sitting at stores. Nobody wanted them. Then the movie came out, and people were like, oh, this Yelena character is pretty fucking badass. I want merch of her. And the Funko Pop that was previously on clearance everywhere went through the roof it's like a 150 dollar funko pop at this point i regret not buying more of them from the importer exporter business i bought one because i was like oh cool this is uh jd from scrubs his girlfriend i'll buy this thing oh. uh but i wish i had bought more because that movie was delayed so long and they were just like all right let's not make any more merch because this movie is so far delayed it's gonna flop and it blew up in their face yeah, and it's just one of those things where I remember the movie was supposed to come out in May of 2020. Yep. And they just kept shuffling it and shuffling it and shuffling it. And I remember seeing the toys on the shelves pre-pandemic. Like, it was February-ish of 2020, maybe, yep. like, the week before the pandemic. And I saw, like, not the Funko Pops, but, like, the toy toys, like the Marvel Legends figures and stuff like that, right? Yeah. I just remember at my store... Uh, just a pile of them and I get them for like four bucks a piece. I wish mm -hmm. I had bought every fucking one of them. <laughs> oh, well. Anyways. So you mentioned in regards to defenders and everything that I have um, this week on the major wrestling figure podcast. If you listen to the version that comes out on Friday for pours, <laughs> um, you will hear a fantastic opening. Uh, Spoilers, but not spoilers. Hashtag Stiffy must pose. <laughs> uh, that's changing quite a bit. But on there, Broski mentions that someone in the Facebook group that Adam loves <laughs> went and made their own defenders for uh, micro brawlers. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And Broski bought some. He tested them out and he did say full disclosure, both the guy that was selling them. And Broski himself, like some of your bigger micro brawlers, it may not fit, right? Yeah, like the Bob Cardona. Like the Bob Cardona, or I'm going to guess like the Shockmaster or so forth, like the bigger ones, right? Yeah, the Shockmaster's normal size. I think the Bob Cardona is the only one, but go ahead. Okay, but you get what I'm saying, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, oh, he said the guy's name, but I can't find it. 
we did some sleuthing. We found the guy. Uh, I messaged the guy and I'm like, hey, I only need five, right? Even though I have a bunch of micro brawlers, a couple of the micro brawlers that I bought were when they were still in bags. Uh huh. So I didn't keep the bags, but any of them that were that came in like your standard like blister pack looking things. Yep. So I only need five. Okay. And we're pretty deep in the show, right? I could kind of say this whole thing out here, right? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Okay, because there's a part of it that I didn't tell you or Kevin, right? Uh, yeah. I wanted to save it for the show, okay? So I messaged the guy, and I'm like, all right, I messaged the guy. If the price is crazy, I'm just going to pass. You come back, and you say, uh, I found a post from December. I uh, said it was thir- uh, 13 bucks, uh, thirteen fifty shipped for five of them, right? Yeah. Um, and then it says, or 10 for 16 plus, uh, whatever priority would be. Okay. Okay. And, and I'm like, well, I go, that eh, was six months ago. Who knows? They, right. As you put that up, the guy messaged me and said it would be 20 plus shipping for 10. Okay. Okay. So I'm like, okay, well, we're done. Um, and then some other secret stuff that we can't talk about on the show. Uh, so the guy messages me back and I'm like, oh, hey, you know, that's I go. No, thanks. Um, and I saw that he lives relatively close to me. And he <laughs> right. works even closer. OK. Yeah. Uh, and I go, ha ha. I go, I only need five. I go, I'd be willing to drive to you to just pick them up. Right. Yep. And he goes, 10 is this 10 is the least I'll do. And I go, okay, I only need five. I asked around to other people. Nobody else I know needs them. Thanks, but no thanks. You know what I mean? Yeah. So then he messaged messaged me back the next day. And he says, I found a smaller box. (laughs) I could do you five for 16 shipped. (laughs) Oh, he found a smaller box, Joe. Meaning he reached in and grabbed five of them? And then, and then he said, just don't tell anyone I sold you less than 10. Oh, uh, Joe Lemonhead Clegg. Uh, excuse me. What? Uh, clear my throat. <laughs> the hell is that? I don't um, know. <laughs> but we'll see. They'll come in. Um, I haven't gotten the shipping confirmation on them yet. I just paid the guy. Um, oh, so you're not getting them by, in person? No, no, no. I, I, I even said to the guy, I'm like, hey, you, you live blank. And he goes, oh, I work here, which is even closer. Yeah. And I'm like, I would drive you to pick them up. And he said, I found a small box, 16 bucks for the five of them. I'll ship them to you. Mm. Perfect. Okay. So fingers crossed that they're in by, we record next week, and then we'll get the full review of them. Awesome. Yeah. Like I used to buy the rings or not ringside, the pro wrestling tees ones, you know, like occasionally whenever I'd order like a rare micro brawler or I'd buy one in the major group, it would come with one. But like when you said you were looking to buy these, I went and I looked at my micro brawler collection and all of the rare or autographed ones are already in defenders. Gotcha. And I can't put every one of them in a defender. It would just take up too much space. So uh, I was good, but uh, I am interested to hear, you know, just in case something in the future comes up or I need a, you know, I need a defender, you know, I know who to go to. Right. All right, Joe. Uh, I only have one purchase. So if you have more, you know, you're welcome to go again. I do with a cat. So you only have your one last big one, right? I got one, one purchase other than the, uh, the Funko Pop. And the hour that you spent talking with Brett on a weekly purchases. Exactly. If you forget that one little podcast where I spent an hour talking about like 30 things I bought in the last week. Other than that, I just have one thing. All right. So uh, I am in the market for a new MP3 player. Okay. Yes. I heard this on Longbox Heroes After Dark. Yes. It was actually at the beginning of the main show, but yes. No, one of the two. So my MP3, I... I'm never going to be the person that uses their phone as an MP3 player. Okay. I'm just not, it's just not going to happen. I hate fucking pod catchers. They're unreliable. Like I don't even fucking use a pod catcher. And I got the email today from, uh, Apple that their, their thing, their whole thing is going to be down on July, June 25th due to maintenance. Right. Yeah. And I'm like, fuck that man. RSS feeds don't go down on fucking maintenance, man. You know what I mean? <laughs> fuck you. 
<laughs> um, and I like to have the catalogs of stuff. There's certain shows that I'll download where I'm like, oh, I'm going to pull this piece out of because you've been promising that you're going to do it for seven years and I've been doing it for you and I send it to you, big name comedian, and you do thank me for it, but you'd be saving me a lot of time if you just did what you said and put it up on your fucking Patreon and I could just pay the five bucks, download the whole clip without having to edit your goddamn show every month for the last seven years. Anyway, uh, I Sony makes a very good Walkman brand MP3 player. Mayan is about two years old and has seen better days. It's been dropped a lot. Uh, it's, you know, it's been through hell. It's kind of cracked. And now that it's getting hotter, when I go outside with it and it overheats, it thinks that the battery is low, so I can't use it outside. And that was my impetus to start looking for a new one, right? Okay. So uh, the Sony ones that I that I get are discontinued. Okay. Oh no. If I want the current, the last model that they made, which is the one that I had that I bought two years ago, that'll run me about a hundred to two hundred dollars. See, that's the thing. I cannot picture, and this is a guy who worked in importing and exporting. How do they get the nerve to sell a fucking obsolete piece of technology for that expensive? It's it vintage so technology. Oh, I can buy a fucking turntable or an eight track player for less than that. <laughs> I can get the model before this last one that I have. That'll run me about sixty to eighty dollars, right? <sighs> but then I see a bunch of, and again, I'm not gonna say off brand because they're definitely a name, but it's not Sony. It's not like a name that I recognize, right? Sure. And these things run with it. And so I ended up ordering one. And the name of the company is Safuchi. Oh, high end stuff. Right. But it <laughs> looks kind of like the one that I have, but there's like not buttons on it, right? It's actually like touch, you know? Sure. And like the display looks a little off, right? Okay. The folder doesn't organize everything in alphabetical order. It alpha it puts stuff in alphabetical order except for the new stuff that is at the top of the list. Um, the pause function, the the OK button is the play and the pause button. There's no time, there's no like times to play, there's no fast, fast forward, and you know, sometimes I'll be in the middle of doing something at the super secret science job, so I'll pause it. And if it sits for too long, it doesn't pick back up where I left off. It restarts the file that I was listening to. Okay. So it's already going back. It's already <laughs> boxed back up. It's getting ready to be dropped off at the Coles for the free shipping through Amazon. <laughs> yeah. Right. Get your, get your coupon. <laughs> So if anyone out there has a line on the Sony Walkman branded uh, MP3 player at a reasonable price, let me know. Or if you see one of these knockoffs that are good. And so the other thing is, so I start doing a little bit more research on the knockoffs, right? Yeah. Oh, and this is the other thing. So this one that I got, whatever this is, <laughs> whatever whatever brand this is, uh, Savucci, S-A-F-U-C-I-I-V, right? Uh -huh. This thing weighs like five pounds and it's <laughs> tiny, right? Yeah. It's like it's like smaller than a pack of gum and it weighs like five pounds. That's it's all the quality packed in. Well, so that's the thing. It feels very durable. Uh -huh. It has like a little clip on it and it has a built-in speaker. So those are all positives, but the interface doesn't work for me, right? Yeah. Um, and there's also like, uh, buttons on, like there's volume buttons on the, on the right hand side and there's a lock button on the one side, which I'm gr great lock. I put the lock, put it in my pocket. I don't have to worry about shit getting bumped, but the lock on this, like you literally need like two, two fingers to push it up. Right. Yeah. Like that's how fucking stiff it is. It's stiffer than broski. <laughs> Different than fucking Josh Bishop. Go ahead. No, I all again listen on the list of people. I'm sure there's gonna be more people that tell you Broski's stiff than JB is stiff, but either way. But like on mine, because mine's so beat up, the lock button 
it stays, but it don't stay real good because it's kind of beaten up. But all the other ones that I was looking at, there's no dedicated lock button. You have to hit like you have to hit the menu and the the rewind button at the same time to lock the screen. And I'm like, that's too dangerous. That's like too risky <laughs> that I accidentally try to lock the screen and I end up rewinding something that I'm like two hours in on a nine hour podcast. And I'm like, what the fuck? Right. Yeah. All right. First things first, you shouldn't be listening to nine hour long podcasts. Second of all, I assume you're looking at like Amazon and stuff like that. Have you checked eBay to see if any of these older Sony models are available? They're even higher on eBay. Oh, really? Collector's market. All right. Adam. Yes. eBay. Mercari, Amazon, uh, like weird off-brand electronic sites. Uh huh. I was checking everything the last two days. Nothing. Oh wow. All right. Well, I mean, I, I would sympathize with you. I just listen to MP3s and podcasts on my phone like a normal person. But hey, you do you. <laughs> they have this one. It's like sixty bucks, right? Uh huh. And it looks like a flash drive, like there's no display on it or nothing. Oh, okay. And I think that's like the new Sony model, but I don't like it. (laughs) Joe, I'm sure within reach of wherever you're sitting is your cell phone, right? Yeah. You know, you could play, you could play podcasts on that, right? No, I can't. I need my, I need my cell phone for other stuff to like do Pokemon Go and stuff, right? (laughs) But so then that's the thing. Then I have to put the files on my phone, which is fine, but I don't, like, that's just, like, the next step to having a fucking podcatcher on my phone, which I absolutely do not want. <sighs> All right. I mean, there there's literally no reasoning with you on this, so I will just... No. I will just shake my head and agree. All yeah, right, and, cool. like, like the, the model that I have here on eBay, $110, $110, $160, right? Yeah. All and right. then there's like these other ones, like you could get like one of these, like these non name brand ones, right? Uh-huh. For like 40 bucks. Okay. It's got Bluetooth. It plays video. It does, it's got a touch screen. It's got all this other shit. I don't need it to do any of this stuff. Yeah. All right. I get you. I get you. Hopefully you find what you need. You know, I'd hate for you to be behind on the 75 podcasts you listen to on a weekly basis. I listen to a lot of podcasts. No, I know. All right. Is that it for you? That's it for me. All right, Joe. You listened to Porch Talk Presents Weekly Porches as episode two, correct? I did. All right. I don't want to ask you if you did any investigative work to figure out what my secret purchase was at the end of that episode. But I will tell you. I told Brett, and Brett was impressed, and I am sending you a picture right now of what my main event purchase was, and that is the AEW one of 3,000 <gasps> Rare Chase Edition, Mr. Brody fucking Lee figure, sir. Holy that is shit. my main event purchase for this week. I got, I as you sent the text over, I got the preview of it on my phone. And I was like, I gasped. <laughs> Here's the thing, man. I've oh, had that, that box looks nice. It is so mint. The guy sent me pictures from like every angle. So I talked about it on weekly purchases. Uh, the guy was in the major pod group, posted one up. It was like a really good price compared to what they're going for on eBay. Two people messaged the guy asking him like, oh, I'm DMing you. So I messaged saying, hey, did anybody claim this figure? And he said, no. I'm sorry. One guy claimed it, but I have another. So I was like, well, I want to see pictures of the one I'm getting. So he sent me a bunch of pictures. It looks awesome. I have a bunch of them. I only sent you the one from the front. But uh It is like so pristine and I got sick and tired of watching eBay listings because Joe, if you remember when they first came out, they were like a four or $500 figure, you know, we were kind of clocking them and they slowly went down to like 250, 200. 
180 and they were kind of floating around 180 for a while and then they started shooting back up and i'm like fuck i missed my chance but this one in the major pod group was like a really good price and i was like you know what maybe in a couple months in a year what am i gonna do save 20 bucks i don't fucking care i want to check this thing off the goddamn list I want to own it so that if there is another chase down the road, I don't have to worry about, oh, no, I'm two chases behind. I got this one in hand. The guy – or not in hand. The guy shipped it today. It's checked out the list. I am fucking pumped to own the Brody Lee chase. Dude, that's fucking awesome. Thank you. I wow. was I was hoping – I was going to wait until I had it in hand to show you, but – uh like there's pictures from the side and from the back, and I actually edited this out of weekly purchases. Um, kind of in the middle, Brett was like, "Oh, did you see somebody had a Brody Lee Chase in the group really cheap?" And I was like, "Oh yeah, I saw that." So I deleted that from the podcast. And at the end, when I sent him the picture of this, I was kind of describing it, and I had said, "You know how AEW figures are really sensitive at the top because they have like the." fins and like the the j-hook and all that yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I had to delete that out too but like the j-hook doesn't have any dings in it no bends this is a fucking specimen of this figure i'm looking forward to getting it man i'm very pumped and i got it uh i don't want to say really cheap but like a good price you know what i'm saying yeah yeah I, sure listen it's a chase you're gonna pay a couple bucks for it yeah the night before and i'm not shitting you on this so I saw one on eBay, and I had been following it for a while, and the auction was about to end, and it was at like 160 which is a good price for this, this figure. So I was like, you know what? I Same mentality. I was like, I want to check this off the list. With like two seconds left, I bid $201. And it did that thing where eBay, the app on the phone, kind of spins and it said, you are the highest bidder at 186 Ooh. And the auction was over. And I was like, yay, I won the figure. But boo, I spent $186. <laughs> so like I was kind of <laughs> conflicted. But it was spinning, it was spinning, it was spinning. And then eventually the app updated and said, unfortunately, you missed out on the item. It sold for like $202. I was so thrilled the next day when I got this in the Major Pod Facebook group that I did not spend nearly $200 on this figure. So uh, very happy to have it. And if I find a second one in the wild, Joe, it is yours for $21 plus tax or $20 plus tax. Oh, well, listen, man, that's – I'm happy one of us eventually got this, you know? Yeah, I said a while ago when they announced it that one way or another, hell or come, you know, I would fucking own this figure. Uh, so I have it. Uh, I am sure like 1,000 of them will show up at GameStop over the next couple of months and right. it'll drive the price down. But uh, uh, the next one's yours, sir. Well, I greatly appreciate that. Um, you know, obviously it's a highly sought after figure. Um, you know, we didn't talk about the AEW figure releases that came out this weekend. Yeah. Um, I think we might have talked privately in regards to this. The only one that really jumped out at me was uh, the Brody in the suit yeah. as a must buy. Um, you know, I know you get the OC ones, even though it's just like the same figure, just with a different shirt. <laughs> um, and I know everyone else bit on the Tony Schiavone one, but I feel as though I can kind of wait on that one. That's. It's it's a it's a want, but it's not a must buy, you know. Yeah. Um, obviously, I said this on weekly purchases, but I bought the Tony Schiavone, uh, the, the Jamie Hader, the Danhausen, Butcher Blade, Bunny, the uh, Orange Cassidy, the Swerve Scott, the Suited Brody Lee, Buddy Matthews, Brody King, Malachi Black, and the Unrivaled Supreme of the Lucha Bros. I have a lot of figures I need to buy in the next couple months. Right, we got at least another three or four months of me begging for an Ethan Page figure. And yeah, then I how, how the fuck is Abaddon getting a figure before Ethan Page? That makes no sense. No no fucking disrespect to Abaddon, but come on, man. An argument can be made that she's more toy toyetic. <sighs> I mean, I get that, but come on, man. Ethan Page. 
Now, once we get the Ethan Page with the next uh, group, yeah. the spoiler for the next hashtag, it's going to be uh, Cool Hand Ange and Daddy Magic Matt Menard oh. as the hashtag. That's that's oh. who I need next. Uh, you know what? I am with you there. I fucking want figures for them. I am shocked that they never got, like, basics during their NXT run, you know? Yeah, well, again, it's real weird who gets basics and who doesn't, you know? Yeah. All right, I am with you on that. I will share that hashtag. But that's right. it for me, Joe. All right. Well, that's it then. That's everything, you know? Oh, look at that. A short, brisk two hours and 13 minutes <laughs> on the recording of Skype. <laughs> You're never supposed to look at the time. You're just supposed to let it all happen naturally, you know? Oh, all right. All right. Well, everyone, thank you very much uh, for listening, for hanging in with us. This is episode 192 of At Odds with Wrestling. Uh, hope to see you t- this weekend at the LVAC. If not... Uh, enjoy some wrestling regardless and be safe out there, everyone. You're listening to the soon to be named network, the Lamborghini. Of Podcast Network.